Turn with me to the book of Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14 and 15. It says, for this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. So it doesn't have to be so uh, complex. It doesn't have to be so complicated. It doesn't always have to be so deep. Sometimes pastors go, go so deep that everybody gets confused. They go home wondering, what was that all about? But this is simple. Sometimes the simplest truth is the best. God is a father. Part of his family is with him in heaven above. The rest of his family is here in the earth. And we are more than fellow believers and church attenders. Like it or not, we are family. Amen. We are related by blood, the blood of Christ. We have the same spiritual DNA, Zoe, the life and the nature of God imparted to our spirits. We have all been made to drink of the same spirit. We're in the same body. We're connected members one of another. And we will spend eternity together. So that means we may need to reconcile now. If there's any differences, any, any disagreements, any little rift between us. Because in heaven, it might be very difficult to avoid that person. It could be awkward. And then 1 John chapter 5 verse 1 says this. Everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him. Real simple. If you love the father, you love his family. If you love the father, you love his family. The closeness of our relationship to other believers is the clearest indicator of our closeness to God. The closeness of our relationship with other Christians is perhaps the clearest indicator of our closeness to God. You see, there is a correlation between your horizontal relationships and your vertical relationship. In other words, how you treat other people has something to do with how God treats you. He responds to that and vice versa. Amen. Hallelujah. Yes, the Bible says there are some Christians that we should keep at arm's length. That's true. There are verses that say that. The, the idle, the greedy, the immoral. In some places, the Apostle Paul said, no, not even to eat with such a person who calls himself a brother. That's true. But on the other hand, if you cannot get along with anybody in the body of Christ, then you're not as close to God as you think. If you love the Father, you love his family. After his resurrection, Jesus asked Peter famously, do you love me? To which Peter responded, you can tell he's embarrassed by that question. After three and a half years, do you love me? And he says, yes, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus didn't say, that's good to know. Mm, we're tight. He said, feed my lambs. In other words, the way you express your love for the Lord is by being a blessing to his family. Come on, sometimes people say, Lord, I give you my all. I give you all that I have. I just lay down my life for you. But they won't do a cotton picking thing for anybody else in the church. The greatest expression of your love for the Father is by being a blessing to his family. You know, I, there are people that I have not even met, but they helped out my son, my daughter. And those people have a special place in my heart. I bet you feel the same way too. So you may ask, Lord, 
What can I do for you? Well, remember these words from Jesus in Matthew 25, 40. As you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. So that means even the smallest act of kindness to the lowliest member of the body of Christ. Maybe that person is like the the little toe on the left foot. But even the smallest act of kindness does not go unnoticed by heaven. Why am I doing this? Because I love you, Lord. Because I love you, Lord. Amen. You know, think about this. The Bible says, you know, that little children, let us not love in word or in talk, but in deed and in truth. That's not only true concerning each other. That's true concerning God. Anybody can say, Lord, I love you. I love you. I love you. But God would like to see some action. Come on, don't be condemned. Just smile real big and say, glory. Amen. Hallelujah. When I was a student in the university, uh, I worked in the school library. And uh, one older woman also there was was a Christian. She was actually Egyptian. She had migrated from the country of Egypt. And so we both discovered we knew the Lord and we had times of, you know, somewhat fellowship and that type of thing. And, uh, and she shared with me eventually that she was concerned about her daughter, much younger girl. She was concerned. She's hanging out with the wrong crowd, wrong influences in her life. Can you talk to her? Can you speak to her? Can you pray for her? You know, this woman, her husband had left. She doesn't have a lot of fellowship with other believers. She's asking me. So we agreed that I would take both of them out to eat in a restaurant. And uh, so we, we at, the, at the restaurant, I, as the door opened, I shared some thoughts, you know, uh, f- based on the word of God. And, and it seemed to make something of an impression on this young girl and she was listening. And so then later, as I'm driving them both home, I'll never forget it. I heard the Lord speak to me very unmistakably. And he said, I want to thank you for doing this. You see, he takes it personally. When you do it for the least of these, my brothers, you do it for me. However, the opposite is also true. When you do it against the least of these, you do it against him, right? So Paul, who was formerly Saul of Tarsus, he got that revelation on the road to Damascus because the the words he heard from Jesus were, why? Are you persecuting me? And I'm sure Saul was thinking, I didn't do anything to you. No, 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 no. When you come against my church, you're coming against me. When you attack my body, you're attacking me. Come on, some people, you know, that they're not very helpful regarding the church. You better think, better think a little bit about your life. He takes it personally. Let me help you out. The Bible says in James 4.11, in the message translation or paraphrase, don't bad mouth each other, friends. Now, sometimes I'm with fellow believers or even in the ministry, certain people And some folks have a knack, a tendency, just to badmouth other Christians that we know at the table. And that makes me nervous because I'm thinking, I wonder what they say about me when I'm not around. Amen. And here's the deal. In life, sometimes we don't feel appreciated right? We don't feel appreciated. Maybe, maybe we don't feel respected. We don't feel honored. We don't feel that, that we're being valued as we should. And the temptation in those times is to start putting other people down. That's a temptation. Start picking out the faults of every little Tom, Dick and Harry, or especially someone who looks to be honored more than you. Don't go there. That's a trick. That's a trap. 
No, no. If you want honor, so honor. If you want respect, give respect. If you want love, love others. Hallelujah. Lift others up and you will be lifted up as well. Can somebody shout amen? amen. Glory to God. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 6, verse 19, there are six things that God hates. Six things that God hates. Did you know God is a hater? There are some things he hates. And it's a very interesting list. Some of the things that you would put on this list are not there. I mean, we, we might be tempted to say six things the Lord hates. Chewing pawn. Spitting. Especially on my shoe. Rude people. If you're a waiter or a waitress, those who don't tip. That didn't make the list. One thing that did make the list is this. He who sows discord among brothers. In other words, you may never smoke. You may never drink. You may never pop any pills. But if you're like sowing little seeds of discontentment and division, God says, you know, I hate that. I hate that worse than the beer. I hate that worse than the marijuana. I hate that worse than the drugs. I hate that worse than the crime. I hate that. Do you know that I hate that? And you're going, what? Amen. Amen. So mm, be a unifier, not a divider. In the body of Christ, be a unifier, not a divider. Amen. That doesn't mean we have to agree with everything everybody does or says. Sometimes we, we, we honestly don't for various reasons. But it would be helpful for all of us if we tried to find the good in our brother and sister and tried to highlight what's best in others instead of always trying to hunt for some defect. Some people say, well, see, I have the gift of discernment. That's my anointing. And I can, I can see, I can, I can discern, you know, all the faults of others. They have the gift of fault finding. Well, go look in the mirror. Use that gift on yourself for an hour and you'll turn it off. You'll never use it again. I promise you. <laughs> Isn't it funny? Isn't it funny? When it comes to the other person's shortcomings, we have 20-20 vision. We can see them across the room. And we are legally blind when it comes to our own misgivings. Can I get an amen? Let's go back to Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14 and 15 again. Now, in these two verses, there is a, a play on words in the Greek language. So it's not obvious in English, but there's, a, there's kind of a play on words. It's, it's, it's interesting how it's worded because... The Greek word for father is pater, not potato, pater. And the word for family is patria. That's where we get the, the name Patricia, patria. Pater, patria. Because the word for family means that which comes from a father. That which comes from a father. So this family of faith came from the father above and, and, and from him, every family derives its name. See, and to me, at least what that means is God did not adopt the title of father to help us better relate to him. He didn't say, well, you don't know who I am. So think of me as a, like a father. You could call me father. You could think of me as like maybe a friend or, you know, whatever works for you. He did not culturally appropriate that term. He didn't borrow it from us. All fatherhood originated with him. The very concept of fatherhood came from him. He is the first and the ultimate father. And you'll never fully appreciate who God is 
until you know him as father. I mean, a lot of people in the church world, you know, they know him as God. They know him as Lord. uh, They know him as Savior. But not everybody really knows him as Father. It's interesting that Jesus referred to God as Father a hundred and eleven times in the book of the Gospel of John alone. He called him father a whole lot more than he called him God. That's just the gospel of John, 111 times, you see. And he went to the cross so that God could become our father. That's the whole reason. At the empty tomb, he met Mary Magdalene and he told her, Go tell my disciples, I'm ascending to my father and your father, my God and your God. He is just as much our father as he is Jesus's father. See, God doesn't have any stepchildren. He don't have any illegitimate children. Only sons and daughters. The person sitting next to you is as much a child of God as you are. If they know Jesus, they are. There's not first class, second class, third class. He's no respecter of persons. Amen. Anybody agree with that? Hallelujah. And Jesus, the Bible says, this is a real kicker. Jesus is not ashamed to call us brothers. That's something. That means when you get to heaven... You will call him Lord, Master, and Savior, and and right, but he will call you brother. Why? Because we have the same father. We have the same father. Amen. In John chapter 5, verse 20, Jesus himself said, For the Father loves the Son and shows him all that he himself is doing. In other words, because of his love, he's showing me everything that he is doing. And guess what? He loves you just the same. He loves you just the same. And that means he will reveal to you, if you'll listen, if you'll wait before him, he'll show you everything he is doing and wants to do in your life. So stop saying, when I get to heaven. No, you don't have to wait to get to heaven. Right now, he'll show you. He'll lead you. Amen. Amen. Then again, let me read this to you. Psalm 18, verse 30, New King James Version says, As for God, his way is perfect. You see, he's more than a good, good father. He's perfect. He's a perfect father. Hallelujah. No man ever loved his family more than God loves us. He proved his love when he sent his son. He gave us his best. If he did not spare his son, why would he withhold any other blessing from us? Hallelujah. Amen. And the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 14, 2 Corinthians 12, 14, for children are not obligated to save up for their parents, but parents for their children. He's a perfect father. Our father made plans for us before we were even born. In fact, before the foundation of the world. And he prepared good things for us, better than you could ever imagine. And he has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. He made us heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. And he has ascribed these things. He has accredited these things to our account. And then he gave us his Holy Spirit so that we might know what belongs to us and who we are. 
And there isn't anything your father wouldn't do for you. I said, there isn't anything he wouldn't do for you. He's an ever present help in the time of trouble. He's not an absentee father. He's not a deadbeat dad. He will never abandon us. He will never relax his hold on us. He will always be with us. He lives inside of us. Where you go, he goes to. He's a perfect father. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 11, in the Passion Translation, Jesus said, If you, imperfect as you are, know how to lovingly take care of your children and give them what's best. How much more ready is your heavenly father to give wonderful gifts to those who ask him? I think the heartbeat of our father can be heard in those three little words. How much more. Think of the most gracious and generous father on earth. Think of the kindest, most tender hearted person you know. Your heavenly father is a thousand times better than that. And he's your father. He's your very own father. Most Christians greatly underestimate the goodness of God. He will do things for you that you would not even do for yourself. I can testify as I stand here this morning that in this year, this is only June. In fact, in the last few months, God, of course, it, it happened through a certain way, but God gave us a new house. We got a new car. And then someone came forward and said to my wife, we want to buy pastor a new car. She said, we already have one. We want to buy him a better one. I said, I don't need a car. They said, yeah, but you have to take it. Are you listening to me? And don't, don't be jealous. He's your father too. He'll do good things for you as well. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm next. How about you? I'm next. Amen. The Bible says in James chapter one, verse 17, Every good gift. It was quoted earlier. Every good gift and perfect gift is from above. Even the smallest blessing or favor, even the smallest act of kindness, that tells me your father was behind it. Sure, it was a man. It was a person who gave you the money, who, who helped you out, who visited you. But I believe it was the spirit of God that instigated that situation, that positioned you and that person that, that, that spoke to their heart, that opened the door, that gave you the opportunity, that gave you the idea, that gave you the strength, that gave you the wisdom. When we praise God, we're not being generous. We're being honest. It's from him. Everything you have that's good and right, it's from him. And I think the devil wants you to focus on all that you don't have so that you'll be ungrateful. But think about all that you do have. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. And I love how that's worded in the Passion Translation. Your father is ready to give wonderful gifts. And that means he doesn't need to be persuaded. He doesn't need to be pressured. You need to know this. He's not a stingy God. He's not a penny pinching, close fisted miser. Hmm? He's not trying to squeeze blood out of a turnip. He gives generously to all and without reproach means he won't find fault with you because you have a need and you ask him to fill it. And he loves cheerful givers because that's who he is. He himself is a cheerful giver. See, why would he tell us don't give reluctantly and out of compulsion. And then he gives reluctantly. And I, I don't really want to bless you, but he's not poverty stricken. Your heavenly father is not broke. He doesn't show up anywhere broke. He's rich. Some of you look offended by that. You should be rejoicing. I said, he's rich. 
Amen. The earth and the fullness is his. The cattle on a thousand hills, the silver and the gold are his. He, it belongs to him because he made them with his words. Hallelujah. And he said in Isaiah 48, 17, that he would teach us to profit. What are the good qualities of a good father? What makes for a good father? Well, they must be the same attributes that our heavenly father has because he's the ultimate father, the epitome of all fatherhood. He's more than just good to us. He is the best and the best example to all fathers. We can't mention everything. Time does not permit. But here's just a, f a few things, maybe three things. One thing that comes to my heart is this. Stability. What makes for a good father? Stability. In Isaiah 33, verse 6, we read, And he will be the stability of your times. God is our rock. He's unshakable. He's consistent. He never changes. You know, God is not moody. I'm not really feeling the love this morning. I don't know. I had a long night. No, no. He, he's the same. He never changes. Hallelujah. Amen. And he wants us to be solid and steadfast. See, remember that when Jacob was prophesying over his sons, he said of Reuben, you're my firstborn. Unstable as water, you shall not prosper. Wow. You need to be consistent. Some people are erratic, up, down, in, out, here, there, you know, whichever way the wind is blowing, you never can tell. Amen. But good fathers are stable and they have emotional stability. So men, we need to learn not to overreact. You don't have to blow up like a bomb. Every time there's something that goes wrong, kaboom. Some people say, well, I only get anger, angry for a moment. I explode with anger, but then it's immediately over. And that's how bombs work. It's immediately over. And then, then there are dead people lying all over the room. That's not a good thing. <laughs> Amen. Our families, men, we need to keep our composure in the difficult times. We need to be steady in the storm. You know, if the children are, are screaming and the wife is frantic, you need to be the rock. It's okay, we're gonna be there. Some men, if they're sit, flying on an airplane and there's a little turbulence, are the first one to stand up and say, we're all gonna die. <laughs> be emotionally stable. When you hear bad news, and it's, it's probably gonna come at some point, don't have fearful thoughts. Don't panic. Say, it's going to be all right. You know, I'll just say this too. Inside, you may be going, <laughs> but outside you say, it's going to be all right. <laughs> because they need you to be strong. They need you to be steady. Women tend to be more emotional than men. That's not always true. Women tend to be more emotional than men. And I think that many women need a man who's emotionally stable. It's going to be all right. Don't worry about it. Hey, we got this. Let's pray. Believe God. It'll work out. <laughs> Instability in fathers creates insecurity in children. Come on, I'll say it again. Instability in fathers creates insecurity in children. Those children feel unsettled, unsure. They have a fragility about them because they didn't have that stability, that consistency in their home. And as I often say, maybe you didn't come from a good family, but a good family can come from you. And, and those of you who are older, you know, if things weren't the best in your family, you know, your, your children, your grandchildren have a second chance. 
And you can be a positive influence in that way. Now see, my father passed away in 2017, October 2017. And uh, there's a lot of shortcomings my dad had. He, he was not artistic. He was not like a singer or anything like that. We would never have him up here. No, no way. He, he, uh, there's a lot of, lot of areas, you know, that maybe he wasn't so good. But one thing, he was really strong. Boy, was he stable. He was super consistent. He was predictable to a fault. Uh, in, in my lifetime, growing up in that house, we moved only twice. And we were first in the, the house where I grew up in as a, as, a, as a baby, a child. We moved to another house and then we moved to another house. All three houses were in the same colony, just a few streets away. I mean, you know, that's pretty consistent. Again, he had one job his entire life. Till the day he retired, he had one job. He woke up, I mean, he was a creature of habit. He woke up, had his breakfast, dressed, went to work, came home, very consistent. Hmm? We only changed churches in my, in my, all the days I was, you know, at home, we changed churches once when I was 16. We were raised Presbyterian, as you know, God's frozen people. And then our family changed to, they changed to another Presbyterian church that was more or less spirit filled. And he was in that church till he died. And he was in church every Sunday. Yeah. We didn't wake up in our family with a moistened finger in the air. Which way is the wind blowing today, honey? You know, I'm not, I'm not feeling church in my bones today. I feel like the Lord is leading me to stay home and watch YouTube. And he sat virtually in the same church bench every Sunday. I think he thought that was his bench. I own this bench. <laughs> One Sunday we came to church and there was some visitors sitting in his place. He made them move. <laughs> I'm not making that up. He's like, no, come on. <laughs> and he ate more often than not, practically always, he ate in the same restaurant after every service. He was a very predictable person. I'm not saying that you have to do that, okay? I'm just saying. But see, really that was a good thing because he was consistent, he was dependable, he was reliable, he wasn't a schizophrenic. He wasn't somebody, he wasn't Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Some church members, we see them in the marketplace, we don't recognize them. Be the same person in here that you are out there. I have a friend, bless his heart. He never stays in one place more than a few months. I mean, one locality. Yeah. I mean, you know, uh, he moved his whole family to this place because, you know, the Lord has spoken. And then a few months later, they all moved back again. I guess the Lord changed his mind. I don't know what happened. (laughs) Then they all moved to another country because this is the plan of God. We have heard from heaven. And literally like just a few weeks later, they all moved back again. I guess that wasn't heaven. And on and on and never staying in one place more than, I don't know if, if even, well, maybe lately they're doing better, but I mean like a year in one place is like his record. Now, I know there are people in the military or have government service. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about someone who willingly is just moving all over the place. Are you listening to me? See, but that instability hurt his family. It frustrated his wife. And it's difficult for them to make friends because just about the time they get settled, uproot the family. Let's go to some other place. People need stability. People need stability. Before you just quickly, on a whim, move your family to Dubai, think that it may cost them. 
Pray about it. Make sure you've heard from heaven. Better to be slow and sure than just quickly respond to some little impulse that maybe hits you one afternoon. Better to be slow and be sure. And whatever the will of God is for our lives, it's going to include some unpleasant places. It's going to include some difficult people. It's baked in to the recipe. See, if you're always running from unpleasant people, you're going to be doing a lot of running. There will always be challenges. And you will always be tempted to quit. Someone asked me, Pastor John, have you ever been tempted to quit? Every day, honey. Every day. Amen. Wives, you'll be tempted to quit the marriage. Husbands, you'll be tempted to quit the family. Stay steady. God didn't quit you. Amen. Amen. Just because you forgot to celebrate Easter, God didn't say, that's it. It's over. The relationship is over. (laughs) Amen. Hallelujah. Isaiah chapter seven, verse nine says this. If you are not firm in faith, you will not be firm at all. You need to believe that God will see you through it. That every challenge is an opportunity for the Lord to show himself strong on your behalf. And if you run from trouble, as I said before, you'll be doing a lot of running. The devil will chase you all over the country, all over the world. Amen. Number two, I got to move quickly. What is the quality that good fathers have? Well, I, this is what came to my heart. Reasonableness. Reasonableness. Philippians chapter four, verse five. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. The Greek word here is perhaps pronounced epiikes, epiikes. And it's a word that is very difficult to translate because it doesn't have a single English equivalent. It's a combination of several factors. In other words, we don't have a word in English that exactly means this. It means gentleness, moderation, and forbearance. It also includes graciousness and unselfishness. Perhaps the best word to define this Greek word is consideration, being considerate. See, good fathers are not harsh and overbearing. They're not demanding and domineering. 1 Corinthians 13 verse 5 says this, Amplified Bible, Love, God's love in us, does not insist on its own right or its own way, for it is not self-seeking. That my way or the highway mindset will drive your children away from you. Love does not insist, always insist on its own way. Amen. Brother Hagin traveled for many years in ministry. He usually stayed in the home of the pastor. He said one pastor he stayed with was a, like this. He was domineering man. He, he ruled his household with an iron fist. He was overbearing. His attitude was, you know, I'm the head. I'm the head of this house. You do what I say or you're going to get a knuckle sandwich. He's a pastor. Glory. And his children and his wife are just cowering in fear before him because he's a tyrant. The Bible says the husband is the head of the wife, the way Christ is head of the church, not the way Hitler was the head of Germany. Amen. Hallelujah. And Brother Hagin had sometimes little interesting little sort of debates with this pastor And eventually was able to convince him from the scripture. And the pastor reluctantly said, well, this pastor said, I might be wrong. When he left the room, the wife and children said, this is the first time we have ever heard him admit that he might be wrong about anything. That's not good. That's not reasonableness. Are you out there today? As soon as the children were old enough, they took off. When the children left, 
The wife left too. They were tired of that. Amen? You lose it. You lose your family. While I'm on the subject, men, Christian men, don't become a hot-headed, argumentative zealot. A disagreeable, contentious old fellow who delights in debating everybody and proving everybody wrong. You got to give everybody a piece of your mind. You're going to lose your mind and you're not going to have any friends. You may win the debate, but if you make everybody else feel small, what have you won? What have you accomplished? You may be technically right about a doctrine or something, but if you have this harsh, unbearable attitude, you're still wrong. Amen. Amen. James 3.17 says this, but the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. Epi case. That's the word, reasonableness. Amen. Do you know, you don't always have to be right. You don't always have to be right. Do you know you don't always have to have the last word in the conversation? Do you know sometimes people can disagree with you, you disagree with them, but you can just say, well, right. You know, maybe, maybe you're right. You, know, you, don't, you don't have to make it your aim to go on a search and destroy mission every time somebody doesn't agree with your opinion. That doesn't show how spiritual you are. It shows how pharisaical you are. Now, I'm not talking about compromising the truth of God's word. Sure, and there are, there are lots of issues that are non-negotiable. We're not moving off of that. But you can give people some grace. You can show them a little latitude. Amen? Even if you disagree, you can be kind about it, especially your brother and sister in the Lord. And what motivates you really? Is it love of truth or is it human ego? Number three, a winning spirit. Second Corinthians 2 14 says this, but thanks be to God who always, who in Christ always leads us in triumphal procession. A very valuable attribute of good fathers, attribute of good fathers is a winning spirit. Have a positive outlook. Have a contag contagious, can-do attitude. Instills confidence in others. Paul experienced many setbacks in life, but he wasn't bitter. He wasn't melancholy. He wasn't sour on life. He had a resiliency from God. He always bounced back. Are you listening to me? He had a spirit of victory in him. And if you have that, it will be spread to your children. Amen? One of the best things we can do for our children is to believe in them. See, I think the thing is, in your heart of hearts, you see that boy as a failure. And even when you try to say something positive, failure comes out. The smell of your disapproval can be detected a mile away. See the best. See his potential. Celebrate his victories. See him as an overcomer, even when he's struggling, even when he's stumbling. You're the father. You set the tone for the house. Let it be one of victory. God is with us. We're victorious in him. Be an encourager. Many fathers are very generous with their criticism and stingy with their praise. But encouragement is oxygen for the soul. Amen. Console them when they have difficulties. My oldest son graduated from college. He got a job, kind of like his, maybe his first like quote unquote real job working for one company. He had to go through a, a long process, interviews and that type of thing. And so we were, we were happy for him. 
But the fellow he was working directly under was sort of a cantankerous man, disagreeable, and I don't know what the deal was, but you know, I think he just didn't like my son. I'm not sure, but I don't think he liked him for various reasons. And within a short while, I mean, it was just like a, 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 a couple of weeks or something, he was fired. And to this day, I don't think my son knows this, but when I heard the news, me and my wife went in our bedroom and we wept like babies. We just wept because we felt so heartbroken for him. And we prayed like it was a matter of life and death. See, some, some parents, when their children falter, they're angry because they find it embarrassing. Listen, what society thinks doesn't matter. That, that's not important. What matters is we love this kid and we want him to do well in life. And remarkably, he bounced back. He actually did much better than, than he, he took it better than me and Jeppy did. <laughs> and he secured shortly thereafter a better job and he did well. Are you out there today? I read a post online last night from one woman in America. She works with young men who are incarcerated in prison. And she painted a bleak picture. She said, these fellows are angry. They're bitter. They're frustrated. They're violent. They're crude. They're obnoxious. They're immature. And without exception, they had no fathers. She said, that's the thing. That's the epidemic. They had no fathers and no father figure in their life who would see that young man and mentor him and train him. Thank God for moms, but we have to have fathers in the home. Even to correct and, and lovingly discipline, we have to have fathers. And I realized that we have a lot of good homes, a lot of good fathers, but I know there are also others who have that empty look. Sometimes there's a good family, but they just shipped off the kid to some hostel somewhere and hardly ever interacted with that person. Be, be a father who's intricately involved with his children, who communicates. I'm so thankful we have these modern communications. Me and our children, we communicate every day back and forth on, you know, what's up, social media, things like that, chat, things like that. And it's so helpful for us. And we, 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 we do our best. Of course, they're grown now. We do our best to communicate with them. Good fathers pray. Good fathers glean wisdom from the word of God. Good fathers look to their heavenly father. And they learn, this is what I should be. This is the goal.